In this video, we're going to explain exactly how to write up the discussion chapter for a dissertation, thesis, or any other kind of formal academic research project. We'll walk through the process step by step so that you can craft your discussion section with confidence. So go grab a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, whatever works for you, and let's jump into it. Hey, welcome to Grad Coach TV, where we demystify and simplify the oftentimes intimidating world of academic research. My name is Emma, and today we're going to explore the discussion chapter, which follows the results chapter in a typical dissertation or thesis. If you'd like to learn about the results chapter, which lays the foundation for the discussion chapter, we've got another video specifically covering that. I'll include a link in the description below. If you're new to Grad Coach TV, welcome, and be sure to hit that subscribe button for more videos covering all things research related. Also, if you're looking for hands-on help with your research, check out our one-on-one -on -one coaching services, where we help you craft your research project step by step. It's like having a friendly professor in your pocket whenever you need it. If that sounds interesting to you, you can learn more and book a free consultation at www.gradcoach.com. All right, with that out of the way, let's get into it. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of how to write up a discussion chapter, it's useful to take a step back and ask the question, what exactly is the discussion chapter and what purpose does it serve? If you understand both the what and the why, you'll have a much clearer direction in terms of the how. So what's the discussion chapter all about? Well, the discussion chapter is where you interpret and explain the analysis results within your thesis or dissertation. If you've watched our video about the results chapter, you'll remember that the results chapter is where you purely present and describe the findings, not interpret their meaning in relation to your research questions. So in the discussion chapter, you'll unpack your analysis findings in terms of their meaning, and you'll discuss the significance and implications of your results. In the discussion chapter, you'll connect the dots between your analysis findings and your research aims and research questions. In other words, you'll explain exactly how your study's results help answer your original research questions. In addition to this, you'll also link your findings back to previous studies and literature, which you would have covered in your literature review chapter. You'll discuss whether your findings align with the existing research or not. If not, you'll explore potential reasons why this might be. Simply put, the discussion chapter is there for you to interact with and explain the meaning of your research findings thoroughly and coherently. A good discussion chapter takes the findings that you presented and described in the results chapter and explains what they mean in relation to your research aims and research questions, as well as how they fit into the existing literature. If you're not sure how this differs from the results chapter, Remember, we've got a separate video explaining that chapter in detail. I'll include the link below. Okay, with that out of the way, it's time to take a look at what you need to include and exclude in your discussion chapter. Let's do it. Okay, so let's take a look at what goes into the discussion chapter. An important thing to note up front is that for most studies, the results and discussion are separate chapters. But in some universities and programs, it's preferred to combine the two into one chapter. So before you start writing, be sure to check with your university or dissertation supervisor what their structural norms and expectations are. In this video, we'll treat the results and discussion as separate chapters, as this is the most common. So what goes into the discussion chapter? Basically, your discussion chapter needs to analyze, explore the meaning, and identify the importance of the data you presented in your results chapter. In the discussion chapter, you'll give your results some form of meaning by evaluating and interpreting them. This will in turn help answer your research questions, achieve your research aims, and lay the foundation for your conclusions. In practical terms, this means that your discussion chapter needs to focus on the findings that are directly related to your research aims and research questions. 
In other words, the core contents of the chapter should directly address the research problem you've set out to solve. Nothing more, nothing less. Don't waste precious time and word count on findings that aren't central to the purpose of your study. If you're not sure whether to include or exclude a particular point, ask yourself whether it directly relates to the research aims or not. This is the simplest way to assess what to include and what to exclude from this chapter. Since the discussion chapter is based on the findings presented in the results chapter, it is vital that you don't report any new findings here. In other words, you can't present claims in the discussion chapter if you didn't present the relevant data in the results chapter first. So make sure that for every discussion point you raise in this chapter, you've covered the respective data analysis in the results chapter. If you haven't, you'll need to go back and revise your results chapter accordingly so that you have a firm foundation for discussion. If you're struggling to get started, try writing down a bullet point list of everything you found in your results chapter. At the same time, take this opportunity to assess whether each finding is relevant. In other words, that it directly addresses or connects to the research aims and research questions. From there, you can craft a list of points you need to cover in your discussion chapter. Right, with that out of the way, and to look at how to actually go about writing up the discussion chapter. Let's jump into it. Now that you've got a clear idea of what the discussion chapter is and what it needs to cover, we can look at how to go about structuring and writing up this important chapter. Broadly speaking, six core components need to be included. Let's take a look at each of them step by step. Step one, restate your research aims and questions. The first step in writing up your discussion chapter is to remind the reader of your research aim or aims and research questions. If you have any hypotheses, you can also briefly mention them here. Don't stress if you don't have any hypotheses though. Every study is different. This reminder for your reader is very important because after reading dozens of pages, they may have forgotten the original point of your research. In other words, your research problem and purpose or become distracted by something and digressed in another direction. It's also likely that some readers will skip straight to your discussion chapter from the introduction chapter. So this little reminder helps create a smooth flow and connection between the two chapters. In practical terms, this section shouldn't be lengthy. It's just a reminder, not a full explanation. So a paragraph or two should be ample. Don't waffle on it or it'll start to feel repetitive. Step two, summarize your key findings. Next, you'll want to summarize your key findings from your analysis. In other words, the findings that directly relate to your research questions. What this looks like will depend on whether your methodology was qualitative, quantitative, or mixed. For example, qualitative research may report on themes, whereas quantitative research may report on potential relationships. Regardless of the methodology, in this section, you need to highlight the key analysis findings in relation to your research questions. Typically, this section only requires one or two paragraphs, depending on how many research questions you have. Try to be as concise as possible here, as you'll unpack these findings in more detail later in the discussion chapter. For now, a few lines that directly address your research questions should be ample. To help you visualize what this section might look like, here are some examples of the kind of language you'd typically use to present your key findings. The data suggests that, the data support or oppose the theory that, the analysis identifies X and Y as key factors in, these are purely examples. What you present here will largely depend on your original research questions, so you may consider using those to structure this section of your discussion. Step three, interpret your results. Once you've restated your research aims and research questions and briefly presented your key findings, you can unpack them by interpreting your results in detail. Remember, you can only discuss findings that you reported in your results section. Don't introduce new information in your discussion chapter. From a structural perspective, it can be a wise approach to follow a similar structure in this section as you did in your results chapter. 
This will help improve readability and make it easier for the reader to follow your arguments. For example, if you structured your results by qualitative themes in the results chapter, it could make sense to do the same here. As an alternative, you could consider structuring this discussion by research questions or based on an overarching theoretical framework that your study centered on. Every study is different, so you'll need to assess what structure works best for your situation. Whatever the case, craft an outline structure before you start writing and make sure that you apply it consistently. Don't dive into the writing without a clear structural outline. When interpreting your results, you'll also need to assess how your findings compare to those of the existing research, which you would have covered in your literature review chapter. Even if your findings contrast with the existing research, you need to include these in your discussion. In fact, these contrasts are often the most interesting findings and can make for valuable discussion points. In these cases, you'll need to think about the potential reasons why you didn't find what you were expecting and what the significance of this contrast is. Here are a few questions to think about and address in your discussion chapter. How do your results help answer your research questions? How do your results compare to those of previous studies? If your results differ from those of previous studies, why may this be the case? What do your results contribute to your field of research? When you interpret your findings, be careful not to draw conclusions that aren't substantiated or that are reaching a little too far. Every claim you make needs to be backed up with evidence or findings from the data. This can look different for different studies. Qualitative studies may require interview quotes as evidence, whereas quantitative studies would rely on statistical analysis and tests. Whatever the case, every claim you make needs to be strongly backed up by data, which should be covered in the results chapter. Step four, acknowledge the limitations of your study. The fourth step in writing up your discussion chapter is to acknowledge the limitations of the study. A quick side note though, for some universities and programs, this limitations discussion will feature in the conclusion chapter, which is typically the next chapter, rather than the discussion chapter. Each institution has its own structural norms, so be sure to check with your research supervisor or faculty what their preference is. The limitations discussion can cover any part of your study, from the scope or theoretical basis to the analysis method or sampling strategy. For example, you may find that you ended up collecting data from a very small sample with unique characteristics, which would mean that you're unable to generalize your results to the broader population. For some students, discussing the limitations of their work can feel a bit self-defeating. Why highlight your weaknesses, right? This is a misconception though, as a hallmark of high quality research is its ability to identify its own shortcomings. In other words, accurately stating the limitations of your work is a strength, not a weakness. It shows that you understand the ins and outs of research design. It shows that you can think critically about your methodology and provide a foundation for future researchers to build on. Every study has limitations. That's the nature of research. At the same time, be careful not to undermine your research. It's no use talking your project down to the point of uselessness. So tell the reader what the limitations are and that they exist and what improvements could be made, but also be sure to remind them of the value of your study despite its limitations. Step five, make your recommendations. Now that you've unpacked your findings and acknowledged the limitations thereof, the next thing you'll need to do is reflect on your study in terms of two factors. Number one, the practical application of your findings. Number two, suggestions for future research. Again, some universities and programs may prefer that you cover this content in the conclusion chapter rather than the discussion chapter. So be sure to double check what their preference is. The first thing to discuss is how your findings can be used in the real world. In other words, what contribution can they make to the field or industry? For example, if your study explores communication in health settings, how can your findings be applied to the context of a hospital or medical clinic? 
Make sure that you spell this out for your reader in practical terms. Don't assume they'll connect the dots. But also be realistic and make sure that any applications you propose are feasible. The next discussion point is the opportunity for future research. In other words, how can other researchers build on what you found and also improve the findings by overcoming some of the limitations in your study, which you discussed a little earlier? In doing this, you'll want to investigate whether your results fit in with the findings of previous research, and if not, why this may be the case. For example, are there any factors that you didn't consider in your study? What future research can be done to remedy this? When you write up your suggestions, make sure that you don't just say that more research is needed on the topic. Be specific about how researchers can build on your study. Step six, provide a concluding summary. Finally, you've reached the home stretch. In this section, you'll need to provide a brief recap of the key findings. In other words, the findings that directly address your research questions. Basically, your conclusion should tell the reader what your study has found and what they need to take away from reading your report. Brief is the key word for this section. It needn't be a lengthy review of everything you discussed in the chapter. You just need to highlight the key takeaways so that you can lay a firm foundation for the final chapter. A paragraph or two should be enough. Don't ramble on. Now that you understand what the discussion chapter is about, what to include and exclude, and how to structure and write it up, here are some closing tips to help you craft a quality discussion chapter. Number one, when you write up your discussion chapter, try to keep it consistent with your introduction chapter, as some readers will skip from the introduction chapter directly to the discussion chapter. So revisit your introduction chapter to make sure that there is a good flow from that chapter to this one. Number two, don't make assumptions about your readers. As the researcher, you have hands-on experience with the data, and so it can be easy to present it in an oversimplified manner. Make sure that you spell out your findings and interpretations for the intelligent layman. Connect the dots for your reader to ensure they pick up what you're putting down. Number three, have a look at other theses and dissertations from your university, especially the discussion sections. This will help you understand the standards and conventions of your university, and you'll also get a good idea of how others have structured their discussion chapters. Number four, avoid using absolute terms such as the results prove. Rather, use softer terms such as suggest or indicate. It's quite unlikely that a single dissertation will scientifically prove something due to the numerous resource constraints involved in these types of projects. So, be humble in your language. Number five, use well-structured and consistently formatted headings to ensure that your reader can easily navigate between sections and so that your chapter flows logically and coherently. It's generally a good idea to make use of Microsoft Word's predefined styles for your headings and subheadings. This will also allow you to use Word's automatic table of contents generator, which is really handy. If you incorporate these five tips into your writing process and follow the structure we've discussed in this video, you can rest assured that your discussion chapter will be headed in a good direction. All right, so that wraps it up for today. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button and leave a comment if you have any questions. Also, be sure to subscribe to the Grad Coach channel for more research-related content. Also, if you need a helping hand with your research, be sure to check out our private coaching service where we work with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis, chapter by chapter, to help you craft a winning dissertation, thesis, or research project. If that sounds interesting to you, book a free consultation with a friendly coach at www.gradcoach.com. As always, I'll include a link below. That's all for this episode of Grad Coach TV. Until next time, Good luck.